Good morning everyone and thank you for coming. The collection is called Emptying Houses, so I thought I would read the title uh, poem first of all. Now, one of the rites of passage I think we all um, experience in our lives, or most people, is when our parents die and we as executors have to clear their houses of everything that made their life. Um, I had that experience with uh, my parents' house, but also in the same month that my mother died, a, friend, a close friend died, and I was his executor as well. And so these are my thoughts about the experience of emptying a house. Now, it's very easy to think of what one's uh, experiences might be. Oh, their life has gone. Look at all the things they had. This is not, I hope, cliched. It was just one or two things that particularly struck me when I was emptying these two houses. First one, SK, is my mother. The second one, J.I., is the friend. We have taken down the curtains, found new owners for wood and brass. The rooms grow brighter. They were never dull before being lived in, but the sun lays claim to all the vacant spaces, possessive, proprietorial. The new light is everywhere. I hesitate to say flushing, a wash, perhaps, suffusing. This is not a cleansing, simply a history is over, and those who were here have gone their unaccountable way from this point of death. J.I. Working through the house, we found roll upon roll of it, Christmas wrapping paper, as if present giving were assured for decades to come. Brilliant holly pressed hard against bought balloons and snowmen. And all those padlocks in the backs of drawers on window sills, Handy little sets of golden lock and key, Each one holding a secret, a private thought, now silenced. Now with that poem, uh, I wrote another one called Grief, which I will also read. Thereafter, it becomes much less dark progressively through the book. You'll be glad to know, so you won't have a, um, an hour of distress. Grief. Every path you choose will lead into the sh shadow of this mountain. Jagged, daunting, its contours will always surprise you. Altiplano becoming fen. Crevasses opening in orchards. There are no secret passes, no reaching the other side, except this. As for your guidebooks, with their confident geography, discard them. Carry with you instead a snapshot in your back pocket, memories to snack on, words and outings remembered. These will be all you have to move its dark substance by the teaspoonful. When I was putting the collection together and sorting out the poems I wanted to include in, into some sort of order or shape, I noticed, um, looking through them and proofreading and so forth, that I'd used the word detritus twice. And it struck me that quite a lot of the, the poems, certainly the first section, are about detritus in the sense of what we leave behind us when we die and leave this particular world, this plane, what we leave behind is something over which we have very little control. Things decay, things are given away, things are perhaps not valued. And I had found that I had a whole group of poems about time, what we leave behind, legacy. And I look at them, I think, in a, in a wry way. That it's not a depressing sequence. It's just observations on the passage of time, really, and, as I said, detritus. The first one is called Buying Time. The first emperor of all China, Qin Shi Huang, a monster by every account, hoped to prolong his days by quaffing ampules of mercury. They killed him. Life has a kind of justice. It thwarts and it cossets. So how shall I get on? The books are stacking up. Hardly a week without a parcel, novels, poems, 
esoterica, several lifetimes reading a crafty move and gentler on the brain than Mercury. Neatly shelved and alphabetized, they cock a snook at the horror with the scythe. Sorry, I've got to finish this one first, then this one, then... History is made up of disasters and disappointments, brilliance rudely dimmed. So I shall probably be bumping into Qin Shi Huang partway through the letter B, Balzac or Bronte. I hope he's impressed. Uh, I need to explain something uh, in the next poem, which is called Tongues. Um, at the, in the very last stanza, I talk about Pictish stones. And quite a number of Pictish stones have designs upon them, designs which you see in stones from all over the Pictish area. Nobody knows what they mean, and so all we can do is describe them. And I, the words that you might find confusing are the descriptions, the sort of geometrical descriptions of these particular stones, uh, because we have absolutely no idea if they're representational or simply pictures. Tongues. The sad truth about languages is they erode, grain by grain, prefix by particle, no sooner imagined than cracked. History shifts its axis. What once linked empires, Akkadian, Algonquin, fractures, becomes irrelevant, a footnote at best. Old men in a snug corner share memories encoded in arcane quaintness. Arif, Krizzel, Fizgigging, Slaughterbudge, remote now as Etruscan, or Stonehenge's Neolithic Patois. Three Class I Pictish stones found on the moor of Carden. Wind-licked, inscrutable. We scratch at their meaning, our understanding reduced to the literal, Double discs, a tuning fork, Z-rods. Spinal ogham, barely an incision now. As all our under undertakings, songs, memorials, are incised in water, smudged by the next storm's thumb. The other words that you might not have understood, Arif, Krizzel, Fizgigging, Slaughterbudge, are ones I found, one in the poetry of William Barnes, because I live in Dorset, one from the poetry of John Clare, because I grew up near uh, John Clare's village, and one is Elizabethan, because my PhD was in Elizabethan uh, literature. And those words now, I don't think anybody just seeing them would understand. It was just to make the point that these, these words now are arcane and mysterious to us, as perhaps our words will be too. Uh, the next one is called Flint. In the 1930s, um, my father was walking beside the River Neen, which runs quite close to where I grew up, and they were dredging the river, and in the mud that came out of the dredger, he found um, a flint implement, and this is about that particular flint implement. So the poem is called Flint. Buckets plunge in silt with grey abandon. Chains and engine doing their best and worst, dredging life cycles and histories. On the spoil heap, world shells desiccate, amazed by the fatal touch of light. Ruined cresses wrap a shaped stone. My father claims his treasure. Mine now, my turn. As fingers fold around the half, they feel at home, faints of slicing, lifting hide from belly. I am my most distant grandsire. Three boys stalk the river bank, eyes peeled, alert for bubbles, leaves disturbed. Flint, stick or pebble, cocked and ready. And then I tapped it on a stone. I was ten and I spoilt it. The watered patina, unbroken since the stars last moved, chipped open and its heart exposed. I keep it in a box now, 
folded in a cloth. I don't deserve its handshake, and the wound still glares. Now, we can leave behind all sorts of things. Um, we can leave behind part of ourselves, part of our bone, if we're, well, of any age, I suppose. Uh, this is about a, a prehistoric fragment. Specimen is the name of the poem, but it has a subtitle, Paleoanthropus Resentus, which is my own imagined name for this particular um, hominid, who is the one speaking. I am three teeth in a shard of mandible, a thumb's edge, a thumb's length of the ridge where my frown went. He, they say correctly, passing my fragments along the line in white-gloved hands. Their guesses are hushed, as if I might spring up the whole of me, affronted. What I'd say is, in complete sentences, not the growl they might expect, I'd say, I didn't ask to be primitive, it was all I knew, so don't sniff. I could have managed hot water. Sandwiches too, I expect. And even those trousery things that stop you jumping properly. I could cry and sing like you wouldn't believe. And if I strode out into your world all set up, and with whatever you do to your hair, people would notice me and say, there goes quite a specimen. Now, I make the point in a number of these poems that we have absolutely no control of what people think about us, what we leave behind and how we are judged or described uh, in the light of it. And it could be the most embarrassing thing of all that we leave behind. Uh, and this poem deals with that. It's called A Tale of a Turd, a Skitta Saga. A favourite exhibit at the Jarvik Museum in York is a Viking turd, a prized piece of shit, massive and misshapen, all flanges and nodules. Was passing it the perpetrator's finest or final achievement? He is unremembered now, except for this digestive harvest. I shall call him Snorri. Scientists who can bear to do such things, have sniffed this marvel, weighed it, picked some of it apart, concluded that Snorri lived on meat and entertained the usual parasites for his time. Picture that moment. He wriggles himself comfortable on the privy, smug with his achievements, his bargains, his hulking sons. Then, still shuddering, from a thunderous rectal exhalation, he glares back at the monstrous jobby, dares it to bite him, vows to eat more greens with his bacon, wipes ever so tenderly. This is your real legacy, Snorri. Monument and fundament, posterior and posterity, part rhymes reminding us that what we value most may not be what outlasts us. The detritus of a moment, our least regarded signifiers. Snorri's stool, a fly button, a paper clip, the cap from a tube of God knows what, lie there on the palm of history, hardly a blueprint for the whole man. So, Snorri, when Arne Helgeson called you a great piece of shit, the night you brained him, he wasn't far wrong. But consider, all the same, what could be hidden in your brick? The pig that gave its life? Your bellowing about the gravy? That dish with the three knots? All had their complex histories, and all might still be there, at some level beyond the measurable. That makes you shit and a bit, perhaps, a coprolite with a backstory. The poet of the Edda wrote, 
Ja selfen het samen, ik weet een, het oudere der, dommer en dalven werden. You also must die. What remains afterwards is the dead man's reputation. I wonder. How are we doing for time, Janice? If you want to write, uh, read one more, that's all right. Okay. Um, I did my PhD thesis on Robert Greene. Robert Greene, uh, reprobate, despite how he appears in Upstart Crow on the television, died in 1592. This poem is called 1592. Robert Greene was known for his ginger hair, long ginger beard, and his hair pushed up to a point above his head. Uh, that is, I need to tell you that because I describe it in the poem, and that it's a play on his gingery, gingeriness, if you want to call it that. So 1592, about Robert Greene. Robin, not Rob, in Norfolk, Master Robert. Certainly not a good fellow, but I sing, oh yes I sing, sharpened by ginger. A ginger point to my words, a ginger peak for my beard. And a top knot, pointing gingerly heavenwards, ginger humour that. A ginger stream pissed against some wall or other our jaundiced testament. So make us jolly, Robin. Spicy talk, cut purse company, harlot's hair dyed ginger. By God, that peak of yours could pick a hole through London. Ginger runnels, draining life's shit to hell or New Bedlam graveyard, where brown clay, I'm told, enfolds me, jolly red peak and all. The bravery of my excrements Reduced to muck, not dust. I can take muck. Thank you. The next two sections in the poem, when I was sitting through them to, to make the book, not that I wrote them consciously in these groupings, but it's as they turned out. Uh, that it makes them sound a bit like a child's anthology, because we have people and then we have responses to nature. So it, it does read a bit like a GCSE uh collection or textbook except that I don't think a GCSE one would say shit quite so often. Um, the, the ones about people, one is actually a, an autobiographical memory and the other one is jokey, the second one you should not try at home um, and let me find them first of all and you'll see why I said don't try it at home but I do just have to uh, this one is the autobiographical one, or the family one. It's called The Peculiarities of Nans. Um, those of you who've read Side with Rosie by Laurie Lee will remember that there were two old grandmas, Granny, oh, what were they called? Anyway, two old grandmas who hated each other. Um, and I had two grandmothers uh, when I was growing up, so I knew both of them. Uh, and that's why there's a reference to Laurie Lee. Hello, Laurie Lee. My brace of nans were peculiar too. You know what I mean by that. Not twitching or avoided in the street. Just confident in the law they had inherited. Accessing worlds beyond my time. Nan up the gravel. Tess. Famous down the generations for her white stew. The secret of its thick milkiness sweet with carrots and mutton, never passed on, now lost. Its smell drew us from play, a piper with broth, not tunes, offering herby succulents, potatoes transformed into fairy food. My cousin Maureen resurrected it from packets of instant chicken sauce, a travesty of taste, but her son loved it. Scoff this, in remembrance of me. Like all nans, she was a mistress of blackmail, cutting her lawn with scissors to make me mow it for her, but flying through the gate she never left to push a local bully from his bike because he threatened me. She told me once she'd owned a Nazi flag brought home by my uncle as a souvenir. She burnt the swastika and used the rest to polish shoes 
to show just what she thought of him, Hitler that is. In the age of silent films, she and a girlfriend used to pelt the hapless organist with the jelly from pork pies. I picture him bravely playing on as the organ, titanic-like, sank down, his hair sparkling with flecks of aspic like Atlantic foam. Stangrown Nan, Mabel, my mother's mum, lived further away and so I saw her less. She was mistress of suet, a white log of pudding shrouded in muslin and fastened with the largest safety pin I had ever seen. It emerged from the saucepan, glossy and hungry for the sugar or golden syrup we lavished on it. When putting us right about something, she would rest her hand on the table and say, It's like this. It was like this. And now for the one you shouldn't do at home. It's called Grandad's Plot. We buried Grandad secretly beneath his allotment. He'd made us promise enough times. At least eight feet down, mind you. Well beyond the reach of any horticultural zealot's double digging. Grandad was a small man physically, but his influence spread out, you might say, above ground and below, in the living and the growing, like unstoppable mycelium. Those are peas that were his eyes. Of his bones are parsnips made. But we couldn't bring ourselves to eat any of it. Too much like a primitive tribe chomping on their forebears for good luck. You have to draw the line somewhere. We gave the produce to a care home. We thought they'd benefit from Grandad's richness of spirit, his sheer cussedness. Uh, now moving on to the nature ones, um, some are uh, a pure, purely descriptive. Other ones say quite a lot about our interaction with and destruction of nature. This one is called In Praise of Chlorophyll. With the last flakes settling and the sunsets a tad less spectacular, you have, to add, you have to hand it to particulates. Their palate is extraordinary. Stirrings are heard. Life re-emerges from fissures, encarapaced. The air is sensed with feelers. A cocktail of exotic gases, but survivable. Scientists foretold this age of ant and cockroach. A new hurrah of vermin, preparing for empire since the late Carboniferous. Thirteen-legged, hyena-sized, some sinuous, all predatory. Those soft-bodied upstarts are long gone, poisoned, by their own presumption. Their nests, achievements, dust scoured, insignificant. Life isn't exactly back to normal, more a mutated kind of balance. But what if, if only, one thing has managed to remain unchanged, a soft green fro, stretching, rippling, as far as eyes on stalks can see, Grass, simple, vital, multi-purpose, beautiful. And what if, one afternoon, say, in some strange new season, visitors arrive, bipedal possibly, stepping out of their spaceship and treading softly, they might say, we like the feel, we can work with this, best not spoil it. How much longer do I have, Janice? Not worried. If you want to do another one, do. OK. Um, I don't know whether any of you feel that certain colours represent feelings you have or that you don't like doing certain things in certain colours. Uh, this poem deals with that, that feeling. It's called Colour Coding. It's in three sections. The first one I should explain 
The figure I'm describing is the green man. One. Gargoyle sentinels. Rain-worn, wind-scratched. Not me. Snug here, sheltered, lurking. Foliate mouthed, enduring. Ice spew, bay, laurel, mistletoe. Darker, wiser than all those polished liturgies. Oat king, oak king and holly king, my children. Accept our touch of leaves. Second one, I should say, uh, should preface it by saying, uh, when I was teaching, I, I always found myself most comfortable dressing in particular colours, in sort of business-like colours, and at home I dress quite differently, and I, I never mix the two. This is what this second one is about. My daily bread, earned in grey, black, shamefaced, shallow, colour-drained formality, a celebration of the cerebral, restraint. In my own quarters, dressed in the browns of dens, sets, lairs, lodges, curled in a corner, webbed in my own scent, I face the truth. 3. Beige. Pusillanimous. Half-hearted. The colour of, oh I shouldn't really, I wouldn't like to say. I'll just sit quietly over here. I, I don't have an opinion. I might get it wrong. Other colours are so loud, so personal. So look at me. I'd rather not. And when I retired and was sorting out my wardrobe, I found that I had 22 pairs of dark trousers. Some I had never worn, and I had outgrown them. The nature section, they are a little more celebratory um, and perhaps playful, uh, nothing uh, too dark or unpleasant. The first one is called Water Words. Water Words. Short names for these fragments of ocean as they are born, drip, splash, but longer when they have grown into puddle, rivulet, they merge, swirl, gather extra syllables, cataracts, thrash into inundations, surge deliriously homewards, lost in the endless vowel of the sea. When I lived in Wimbledon, uh, I lived in a block of flats that had a nice garden and around the edge of the garden uh, was an arrangement of pebbles to keep the cars off. One day I was coming home from shopping from the co-op or whatever and it had rained and I noticed the effect of the rain on the pebbles around the edge of the lawn. So this one is called Pebbles. Dry, they are blanched, faded, dusty, dim. A garden is no place for such as us. But even the, <coughs> the lightest shower decks out their paleness in jasper, speckles, rouges, a hint of lilac coral or kelp green. They come to life again, briefly and sadly, saying, This is the truth about us. We long to be tumbled on a tide line, threshed, scattered, cast up and down, not regimented in someone's idea of a pattern. Spare us your dryness and let us be watered always. Six fifty eight AM The dawn chorus was hours ago. Now it's the turn of the stragglers, who like <coughs> like me, think that the late worm is as good as any other. six fifty eight PM The coming darkness adds a new quality to trees and distances. The light is strange, and the air is not especially fragrant or warm, but it has a touch like hands. I raise my arm to the window. I had not noticed. The hairs have become silver. They are finer than I remembered. They spin me a cocoon of sleep. Spring is a wanton season, 
flighty, she puts out. In the wood, new brambles nudge me, prickle. The first leaves uncurl like fingers, eager to caress. And there, by the path, snowdrops wink, coyly, knowingly. Soon there will be bluebells flooding between the trees, drenching us in amethyst, sky blue. We will look on in wonder, ravished. Um, one about composition, the pamphlet ends with a number of poems about inspiration and composition. This one is called Moon Sliver. This can be no accident. A fine crack in the curtains and a sliver of the full moon insisting on entry. I wake in the early hours, a splinter of moonlight caught in my eye. I brush it aside with my writing hand, but, slim as a suggestion, it persists. Weakly, I jot down some phrases, try to find the best word for moonbeam, fiddle with gibbous and crescent. Then, resentful, I settle on the pillow, sure that the pointer will move across my head. Let it do its work. Illusions or lyrics, I shall harvest them in the morning. And two very short ones to finish with. And another one about sky, which um, perhaps complements Paul's. Vapour trails. Vapour trails scatter in a March sky, like my conversational lines nudging but not connecting, monologues dissolving into the finest snow. Cleared, the blue sky becomes a canvas for others to trace their arcs on, aiming for better. And the last one is a little message for you to take home. It's called Habits. Take the long way round sometimes. B doesn't always have to follow A. Scuff leaves, kick stones, drift. Jump into puddles more. Remember, they hold the sky. Peep round corners, gaze unfocused, dream. Thank you.